Good morning. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. It is good to be together this Sunday in August. And uh, if you were a guest with us today, we extend you a warm welcome. We are going to begin our worship with a call to worship. And you can find it in your program. Hopefully you picked one up on the back table as you came in. I will read the one part if you want to respond with all. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, with all our hearts. We sing your praise, O oh Lord, with all our might. We place our trust in you, O oh Lord, with full confidence.
eternal God. You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and yet you come to us fresh each new day. You breathe new life into what has grown tired and discouraged. You offer healing for what is broken and worn. You restore hope for what seems impossible. You are the source of life and love for us and all your creatures. And so we worship you as Creator, Christ, and Holy God. One God, now and always. Amen. We work, or sorry, we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Say the Lord's Prayer with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And there is not a temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and our own life. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Isaiah. Can everyone hear me okay so far? Yeah? Good. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, you people who have my teaching in your hearts. Do not fear the reproach of others, and do not be dismayed when they revile you. For the mouth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like gold, but my deliverance will be forever, and my salvation to all generations. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 138, and we'll have refrain one at the beginning and the end. <laughs> Son of the living God. 
And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Now we'll have him. 363, all hail the power of Jesus' name. COVID-19, of course, has been a very difficult time. Many people have experienced sickness and loss. And I saw in the last few days, we have now crossed the 800,000 uh, mark in terms of the number of people that have died. But we know the pandemic, of course, has affected so much more than people's health. We've talked a lot about the fact there's economic recession and high unemployment. And of course, we have been hearing in the news how women, particularly, are feeling stretched in this time where they feel they need to choose between their children and their work. But it's not only been these things that have kind of dominated our news that have been difficult. But as you know, COVID-19 has also affected our worship, what it means to be the church, what it means to gather, what it means to be um, people who are following God in the world. In 2019, it was reported that many faith communities in Canada were at high risk of closure. 9,000 religious spaces could be lost based on this research, which is approximately one third of all faith owned buildings. That stat is a little bit scary because that is before COVID 19. No one fully knows how the coronavirus will affect the church. But we do know that many faith communities have struggled. I couldn't find a lot of 
data about Canada, but in the U.S., there are many churches during the height of the closures when everything had to be online that were running at 50 or 65 percent of their budgets. They had to lay off staff, and even now with reopenings taking place all over North America, some people predict that many churches will suffer a decline of 33 percent in their giving for this last year. And of course, remember, many churches lost their Easter giving as well. It's questionable how many churches will survive. Many churches run already with very tight budgets, and they don't have a lot of savings. One writer estimated that 5% of churches in the, US, in the U.S. could close, and that's five times more than normal each year. Unfortunately, the congregations that are most affected are those in poor areas of the city and congregations made up of mostly people who are considered an ethnic minority or vulnerable. The churches that survive will probably reflect the wealthier congregations. The virus reveals racial and economic injustices that have always been present but have not been as apparent as before. Some wonder if the virus could be just speeding up the evolution of how churches operate. We've known for a while that younger people do not tend to give weekly into an offering plate, and instead they prefer to give online. So perhaps the church is being forced to put more effort into their online presence and into their content. Perhaps some of these changes that we're being forced to make as churches will help us in the future. But it's been interesting for those churches that have reopened, they have not seen people flock back in. We've wondered if this pandemic will spark some kind of revival. And yet, maybe it will just help people stop going to church. What will the church in Canada and around North America look like after this? And will it survive? For those of you who have been gathering with us, you know that in the month of August, I have been preaching on text out of the lectionary, and in particular, we've been focusing on the stories about Jesus and Matthew's gospel account. And over the month, we've been coming back to this question, what attributes of Jesus do we see that can help us through this difficult time? And my hope is today that through today's passage, we will see that no matter what, we can cling to the promise that Christ is the one that is building his church. And nothing, no matter how big the problem or how large the opposition, Nothing can prevail against him. Now, so far in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus has come on the scene and he's been slowly revealing to the crowds and to the disciples who he truly is. He's healed the sick, he's taught with authority, he's been reshaping and challenging how we understand the law and righteousness, he's overcome demons and evil, he's calmed the storm and he's multiplied bread. And there's been very different responses. Some are filled with amazement and awe. There are some who are looking for him to set up a political kingdom, to take out the Romans by force. And also there is a growing resistance of the religious leaders because Jesus is not following their rules and their traditions. And Jesus has been a bit hard for the people to pin down. He does not fit the boxes of what the people expect and what they may personally report that they feel they need. He is so much more, in many ways, than they expected, and yet he is so different than what they had anticipated. 
Now, right before the story that we're going to look at today, where uh, Peter declares Jesus to be the Messiah, comes a few texts that I think are important to give us context. So there's a story we talked about last week, where we see a woman from Gentile territory who's called a Canaanite, who is filled with great faith. And after that, there's a story where Jesus feeds 4,000 people. Very similar to the feeding of the 5,000, which we normally hear about, except the feeding of the 4,000 is important because it happens in Gentile territory. And so they are people that are not Jewish. And we see this miracle also take place for them. And it's symbolic of Jesus coming to heal and, and save the whole world. The crowd is exhibiting great faith. They're hungry for the miraculous and loving power of Jesus. He's been healing the crippled, the, blind, the lame, the blind, and the mute, and the demon-possessed. And they've been praising the God of Israel. After this, Jesus returns to Israel. And he's immediately met with opposition. The religious leaders come to him and demand a sign from heaven. To prove who he is. As if all of the things that Jesus has been doing so far in the Gospels are not enough. And so then Jesus pulls his disciples aside and he warns them to be careful of the yeast of the Pharisees. Now the disciples don't understand what Jesus is fully talking about when he has this conversation with them. But he's warning them to be on guard against the teachings of the religious leaders. And he's trying to help them see that he is the one that they are waiting for. The disciples have kind of found themselves in a giant parable, I would suggest, at this point, as they try to figure out who this Jesus is. What is his true identity? Is he the promised manna from heaven? The one that they've been waiting for? The one who will set them free? Our story today begins with Jesus asking his disciples, Who do you say the Son of Man is? And the backdrop of this story, I think, is very significant. So try to picture it with me. They're in a city, Caesarea Philippi, which hopefully I said correctly, which is a city built by Herod Philip the Tetrarch. So of course it's named after Caesar and it's named after himself, which was very popular to do back then. And it was a city found about 1,100 feet above sea level, at the foot of Mount Hermon. And it was 25 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. So it, imagine it's on the present day border between Lebanon and Syria. And as they're there, in this village, at the foot of this mountain, picture they can see temples in the hills. And one of the temples, of course, is to Caesar, and the other one is to a god named Pan. Imagine the setting for this conversation. The hostility with the religious leaders is increasing, and then the background of the conversation is this beautiful mountain with these religious temples to the Roman gods. And it's here where Jesus asked the disciples about their own beliefs and their own perspective. Now also remember, in Scripture, God seems to have a way of liking to reveal himself to people on a mountain. So I don't think it's a coincidence that a mountain is the backdrop of today's interaction. So notice the question. Who do you say the Son of Man is? Now, when I first looked at this, it seems like Jesus is kind of asking a leading question. Anyone else with me? Why include Son of Man in the question? The other Gospels just who say, who do people say I am? But Matthew throws in this thing about the Son of Man. And one of the things you probably, well, you may know, you've been around a lot more than me, many of you. One of the things you may or may not know is that the term Son of Man is in itself almost a little parable. 
The original audience could hear this term and think many different things. In, the, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, Son of Man is used in the Messianic prophecy of the one who will come and who will deliver Israel. Son of Man in this passage is where the Jews started to build a lot of their theology about who the Messiah will be. He will be given all honor and authority and power, and he's lifted up as this very um, powerful and individual. But in Ezekiel, God refers to Ezekiel all the time as Son of Man. And Son of Man there is a prophet, one who is called to speak on behalf of God. And then just to add a little bit more nuance, if you look at the Psalms, Son of Man there is referred just to being a human being. Psalm 84, what are the human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them. And our English word there, mortals, is similar to the Hebrew that is used for the Son of Man. So the term can be used for just any human being who is in fear of God. So Jesus invites people, when he says the term Son of God, almost into this little puzzle, a little parable. He allows people to land at different conclusions. And so though it may appear to us as a leading question, the original audience may have put it differently. So then the disciples start to get lots of different responses about who they were in Jesus um, be speculated to be. People have said that maybe he's John the Baptist, which I always find interesting because John the Baptist was just killed while Jesus was alive, so I'm not sure how that would work, but that's one of the theories. People say maybe he's Elijah, maybe he's Jeremiah, maybe he's a prophet. Now remember a given promise that the prophet Elijah would come before the Messiah would come. So it seems like people do identify Jesus to be a prophet. They, they are undeniably in agreement that he seems to be speaking a prophetic message. And they do believe that he has been sent by God. And maybe he is the forerunner who is coming on the scene to make the way ready for the Messiah, for the one who will come and save Israel. But it seems like no one is ready to outwardly claim that Jesus is the Messiah. The disciples do not list any group or people that are making that assertion. And though there may be speculation, no one has had the confidence to say it out loud. So then he just turns to them. Well, who do you say it? And Simon Peter, speaking on behalf of all the disciples, he answers, You are Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Matthew uses very Jewish language here, writing to the Jewish audience. The word Messiah, Christ in Greek, reflects this long-awaited rescuer that they've been waiting for. And Messiah means anointed one. It shows that Peter is convinced that Jesus will heal the people and drive the oppressors out of the land. And Son of God denotes some kind of equality with the Father. I think it's unlikely here that Peter thinks that Jesus himself is divine, but he understands him to be the fulfillment of the one who would come from the line of David and rule as their king. So Jesus turns to Peter, and he affirms him. He encourages him. He does not correct. He does not disagree with the claim. And in addition, he actually says that it is God himself who has revealed this information to Peter. See, Peter still does not fully understand who Jesus is or the significance of declaring him to be the Messiah. But what is significant is that the disciples are able to rightly make this declaration in the midst of all the false teaching and theories that are circulating. And in addition, they put their hope in Jesus, knowing that there is an increasing opposition arising from the religious leaders. This, would have, this declaration would have been a risky and significant step. And it is this step of faith on behalf of the disciples 
and against Jesus then with confidence to begin to disclose to them the way he needs to suffer and needs to die, which I believe is our text for next week. So the verse that follows this is one that's bathed in a little bit of controversy. So you may agree with me, you may not, that's okay. But Jesus renamed Simon Rock and announced that he would build his church. Though Matthew has been referring to Simon as Peter in the Gospel, the story shows that this is actually the moment where Simon is renamed Peter. And he's given an identity that is correctly or directly connected to his truthful declaration of Jesus as the Messiah. The Aramaic name is Cephas, and the Greek translation is Petros, and the term on this rock is actually feminine, and in the Greek is the word Petra. So therefore the name Peter is a kind of masculinization of this feminine word, Petra. So what is the significance of Simon being renamed Peter? Well, some argue that Peter actually refers to little stone, that Christ himself is the rock that ultimately the church is built on, that he is the foundation, and that even in this text, Jesus says that he will build his own church. So Peter, then, is just a small stone in the grand scheme of things. And I would say this makes sense in the greater narrative of Scripture, but it does not seem to be exactly what Jesus is doing here. Others argue that the rock is actually the confession that Peter makes, and not necessarily Peter himself. This view makes sense that it acknowledges the significance of the words that Peter said, and the de declaration that he has made, but it does not seem to um, give any reason for why Jesus would then rename him Peter if it is his words that are significant and not him himself. I think both of these views have come forward as kind of a reaction to some of the, the Roman Catholic's teaching on this. And the idea that Peter is the rock that the church is built on is difficult for many who do not identify as Catholic. It appears the way that the text is written, though, that is Jesus is actually saying he wants to build his church on Peter and the rest of the apostles. This will be where everything begins. The apostles' teaching, writing, and testimony will be essential for organizing and for the establishment of the church. So therefore, Peter and the rest of the apostles are the foundation on which Christ will build his church. The confession that they make is a starting place for a new type of assembly. And Jesus goes on to say that not only will he build a new faith community, but that it will prevail. Nothing can prevent it from accomplishing its desired outcomes and blessings until the day Christ returns. If we relate it to the reading that we heard this morning from the book of Isaiah, the Lord reminded the people of Israel that their heritage begins with the Abrahamic covenant. He promised Abraham and Sarah that he would build a nation, a people for God, and he has faithfully shown that he is able to fulfill that covenant. And now, he will begin a people, his church, on the foundation of Peter and the apostles. And he says that nothing will be able to stop it from being built, not even the gates of hate. Now the gates is figurative for the powerful leaders or powers that rule over Hades. So therefore it's likely referring to the powers of darkness, Satan himself, to those who inflict pain and darkness and destruction on the human race. But the beautiful piece that we see here is that Jesus promises that through his death and his resurrection, that we have the hope that God will prevail. And then Jesus has overcome. Sin and death will not have the last word. Jesus reigns supreme and overall, and he will reign forever. Because Jesus is building his church and not humans, we have the hope that it will not fail. He will continue to help it grow and flourish no matter what. And Jesus is establishing his kingdom and 
drawing people to himself. Now the next section I find a little confusing as well. Jesus says that he will give Peter the keys to the kingdom and he'll have the power to loose things and the power to bind things here on heaven and on earth. And it's always been a little bit confusing to me, to be honest. Well, loosening and binding is a Jewish Mishnah phrase. To bind and to loose simply means to forbid by an indisputable authority and to allow with an indisputable authority. This means that Peter now has the authority, along with the other apostles, to declare what is permissible for the people of God in the kingdom and what is not. And we see that this statement acts as a foreshadowing, as the apostles will have to do that very thing once the church is established. There will be much confusion and conflict about how the church should interpret the Old Testament scriptures and how it should relate to those who are Gentiles as they join the kingdom of God. And one of the first examples of this new authority that they have is in Acts 15, 1 to 35. As the church grows, there is a dispute about whether or not those who are converting to Christianity from other faiths need to be circumcised. And we see the apostles, along with the other leaders in the church, needing to exercise wisdom and understanding as they try to judge how to interpret the law and apply it to this situation. Their judgment that people converting do not need to be circumcised loosens the law in this area. And it becomes, and we continue to not practice mandatory circumcision to this day because of the judgment that was made. And not only do the apostles have the power to bind or loosen teaching, they also have the power to admit or exclude people from the kingdom based on what they teach and practice. When Peter preaches the gospel, he creates space for people to receive the gospel message and enter the kingdom of God. And God allows the people to partner with him in establishing the kingdom by using their testimony. Their revelation of Jesus' identity creates opportunities for many to encounter Jesus and be a part of the kingdom of God. So it's interesting here, upon their confession, Jesus strictly orders the people not to tell anyone. And it's clear that he does not want to be broadcasted as the Messiah. I believe it's because he's creating opportunities for people to discover who he is for themselves. And wants people to engage in a process where they need to search and seek for themselves. And in many ways, Jesus' identity will continue to be a little bit like a parable creating questions, and creating opportunities for discovery. So as we think about how this text applies to today, for many of us, I suppose, we wonder how the church in North America may actually be affected by this pandemic. Will all the congregations in our area survive? How will the weeks and the months of closures affect the church? Will giving decrease to the point that churches will not be able to make ends meet, especially with the loss of rental income for many? Even as I look at my own life, as many of you know, but not, maybe not everyone, I have passed a year to start in the faith community in downtown Ottawa. It seems like the worst possible time to think about starting a new church. We know it was a difficult time for the church in Canada before the pandemic, and it will be even more difficult now. So how may this passage offer us some hope? Well, it's important for us today to cling to the teaching that Jesus declares that he is the one who is building his church. And so this is significant because, number one, we do not need to be reliant on the efforts of one individual or a group of individuals to keep the global church going. We can rest on the promise that Jesus will continue to expand his people and that he will continue to be at work no matter what. And number two, even if some churches do not make it, we need to rest in the knowledge that the global church is actually very much alive and well. As we've seen some decline in North America, of the world are flourishing and the church
church is very much alive. And then number three, we need to know that no matter how large the issue, obstacle, or opposition, Jesus promises that the church will prevail. That nothing can stop the work of God in our world, even a pandemic. So we need to know that even if the worst case happens, and many of our local churches close, even St. Giles, God forgive, God forbid, because of the pandemic, we need to know that Christ is still working. In times of spiritual reception and culture, in times of great hostility, Jesus is at work. Christ will continue to draw people to himself. He will continue to raise up leaders. He will continue to plant churches. He is working, even if it looks different than what we have seen in the past. And so I think the big question for us is will we remain faithful? When Jesus asks us the question, even if the backdrop is that others around us are all worshiping other gods, even if the opposition from others is great, with, well, how will we respond to the question of who Jesus is? Do you see him just as a prophet? Just as a teacher? As a miracle worker? Or do you declare him to be the Christ? And if you do declare him to be your rescuer and savior, what does that mean? Is he God incarnate who came and lived a human life who lived among the poor and the lonely to come and bring justice to those who are oppressed, who came and died so that humanity may be forgiven from their sins and set free, reconciled to God and to one another. Who do you say he is? It is your testimony and a life that is congruent with those words that will be the thing that impacts those around you. Hopefully your life will be one that honors Christ and helps point sorry, people to him. As we conclude today, we must remember that Christ is at work, that he is moving in our world even when it is difficult to see him. And we need to trust that he is faithful to his word. He will build his church. He is drawing people to himself. And our job is simply to remain faithful to him and to faithfully give our testimony. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have strayed from your purposes. You set a path for us to follow, but we conform to the ways of this world. You offer us your transforming love, but we cling to the familiar patterns and habits. You give each of us gifts to use for the purpose of your kingdom, but we wait for others to do what needs to do. Forgive us, Lord, for taking the easy way out and failing to serve you with eager hearts. Feel free to spend some time in confession if there's anything on your heart today that you need to confess. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Christ, we are forgiven and set free by God's generous grace. So let us make a fresh start today. God, we lift up the needs in our world. 
We looked at the forest fires that are taking place, we think in particular for California this morning. We pray that you would be with them. I think I saw that there's now a state of emergency that's been declared. God, would you mobilize people? Would you bring rain? Would you work in that place? be with those who are hurting, struggling, and who are losing their homes. God, we continue to lift up uh, the countries in our world who have unrest and who are um, under corrupt governments. And God, we continue to lift up uh, Belarus this morning and pray that you would be present in that place. And God, we pray that you would bring justice whatever that looks like. God, we lift up our own community. This morning, highlighted in our bulletin, we pray for Eva Cunningham, Dorothy Martin, and Virginia Wilson. Would you be with these faithful women, God? Provide for them and care for them, and may they remain in our hearts and may we remember them for the week. We thank you for them. God, we also lift up Bob, as I'm pretty sure he's recovering from the knee surgery. And God, would um, Bob and Jan be on our hearts this week. And God, would you be close to them, would you be healing and nurturing? May they know your presence and your healing power. And then, Lord, we continue to lift up COVID-19. We pray for all the frontline workers. We pray for all the scientists who are rushing to make a vaccine. We pray for political leaders and those who may be doing well with the pandemic and those who, in our own hearts and minds, we feel are not. God, would you continue to bring wisdom? Would you continue to help people think of others first? Would you continue to help balance the difficult balance between economy and health? Would you be present, God? And we continue to lift up those who are racialized people, those who are poor, who seem most vulnerable in the midst of this pandemic. Would you be with them, God? We thank you that we can trust you. We thank you that your word says that you will prevail no matter how hard things get, no matter how bad things Help us to put our trust in you. We pray. Amen. We'll have him 637. Keep my life and let it be consecrated.
Thank you, Sharon and Brenda. I wanted to call your attention quickly to our OSN uh, few announcements. Um, if you look in the blue leaflet here, uh, today is your last opportunity if you would like to give to the PS PWSND um, efforts for your relief in Lebanon. The federal government has agreed to match any donations that we give. So for information about that, please look at your leaflet. Um, we will continue next Sunday service at 10 a.m. here. Um, and also the services are available online. If you hear of anyone who is not yet comfortable coming in person, um, we now have our whole service available online. So you can find it on our website and it is on our YouTube page. Also, coffee hour will take place tomorrow. Uh, we do not do coffee hour after the service right now to allow for more social distancing. We used to do it in the basement. So we do an hour of teleconference on the phone where we catch up and chat and um, hear how people are doing, um, as well as debrief the sermon. So you're free to join us tomorrow. Just a quick note that the information in your bulletin is incorrect. It says 1 p.m. I missed it. It's actually 11 a.m. So 11 a.m. tomorrow, and the information for joining us on the conference is there in the leaflet. Um, trustees, you have a meeting August 25th. Session, you have a meeting 20, uh, August 27th. And the leaflet says banquet hall, but I heard from Isaac that the exact location is yet to be determined. So watch for that. It could be on the scene. I think that is all our announcements. Oh, September 6th, right, we will be moving back to 10.30 for our regular service time. We will be done our summer uh, service time, and we will be back to service at 10.30, so please note that. Now we will move into our offering. This is an opportunity for those who call St. John's their home to give, uh, and to give at a, a place that we worship, and also a place of commitment to the work of God among us. There are um, opportunities to give at the back table. We are not passing an offering plate at this time uh, due to COVID-19 and trying to limit the amount of hands and touch things. So feel free to put your offering in the offering plate at the back on the way out. And um, uh, yeah, you can also always mail uh, stuff to the church or give online, but it's nice and convenient there on your way out. I'm going to read an invitation to the offering and then go right into a prayer. We all have gifts to share. When we give, we give generously. When we feel compassion for those in need, we give cheerfully. Let us share what we have to offer to God generously and cheerfully so that God's good work may continue. Oh God, bless the offerings that we make today as well as the time, talent, and concern we will offer you this week. Keep our hearts free of worry so that we can give what we have freely, trusting your spirit to accomplish more than we can ask or imagine. In Christ's name, amen.
our benediction this morning. We praise you, O God, for being with us in this special time and place. Send us forth with courage to be witnesses of your work in the world. Let us not forget your name or power. Let us not miss your glory in the mundane. Let us not trample on holy ground. Through Christ we pray. Amen.